Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the sixth View Party Network webinar, Early Collaboration, a Recipe for Solutions, Drug Development and Treatment Strategies May Go Hand in Hand conference call, hosted by View Party. My name is Leslie and I'm your event manager. During the presentation, your lines will remain on listen only. And if you require assistance at any time, please key star zero on your telephone and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. You may submit web questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the Q&A tab, indicated by a question mark sign, type your question and send to all panelists. These will be addressed in the Q&A session. I'd like to advise all parties that the conference is being recorded for replay purposes. And now I'd like to hand over to Ingrid Klingman. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ingrid Klingmann. I'm um, a physician specialized in general medicine and um, clinical pharmacology, um, and I am the chair of uh, EFGCP, the European Forum for Good Clinical Practice. EFGCP is a consortium member of um, the UPATI IMI project, um, and uh, our um, our work package uh, that I'm co-chairing with Ilaria Piuzzi is uh, responsible for the network, for our UPATI network, for establishing the European, uh, the UPATI national platforms, um, and organizing events, including this webinar. Um, in most cases, uh, someone else uh, uh, chairs the webinar. In this case, um, I have volunteered to take over the chair because this topic is um, particularly close to my heart because it goes back to the roots of uh, the reasoning for UPATI and I would like to give you a little bit of explanation about that um, in a minute. So let's start um, and uh, use the time then for um, listening to the, uh, to the two cases that we are going to present and um, have time for discussions. Patient involvement in the medicines development process, active, proactive involvement of patients in the medicines development process is the, the key idea behind the UPATI project. Um, the, the reason why UPATI was designed and established was that the idea is great. There have been um, very interesting, successful uh, cases where it showed that this was really a helpful and important collaboration, but there is there are not enough people, um, enough patients who have the level of knowledge about the medicines development process to be able to, uh, to participate in these discussions, proactively give advice, have um, the discussions about best uh, ways forward and best possible solutions. That's why UPATI is there. Um, and sometimes because of all the many, many activities and discussions that we have concerning how to best educate and train the patients, we can forget uh, quite easily about with all that work why we are doing it and this topic for this webinar now was chosen because we wanted to not only remind ourselves why we are all doing that but really also spread the word about successful cases so that it which can demonstrate and show that it's not a dream but it that it can be done and also the type of involvement the type of um, contribution that uh, knowledgeable patients can uh, can make to the uh, successful and important medicines development where the outcome is really relevant for patients how that can work and that that this can be done um, is the topic of this uh, webinar and I would we, we decided to um, present two different cases to you um, in both cases, the, by coincidence, the same people were involved, but it's two very different situations and stories, and therefore we thought it's worthwhile uh, to tell you about that. So it's my big pleasure uh, to very warmly welcome, on one hand, David Harry. Um, David Harry is um, a very experienced patient activist, um, has been involved in HIV and HCV drug development since 2005. He is, in, in, um, he is a patient, um, an HIV patient himself since 1986, so he really lived through all these very difficult times of um, diagno learning about the disease, learning about the um, positive and negative effects of the treatments at that time and living through the, the great successes of, of jointly finding better ways to a treatment that makes it possible today to survive this disease and even live for many years 
with a disease. Um, he is also a work package uh, co-leader in, uh, in UPATI. He is a work package seven uh, co-leader. Uh, the work package seven is um, a very important work package because it is the work package that is supposed to provide the framework for the future collaboration between uh, patients and um, the pharmaceutical industry, ethics committees, and competent authorities, and overall help with the sustainability models um, and opportunities for your party. Um, he is the co-chair of the Patient and Consumer Working Party at uh, EMA, uh, and he has served um, the European AIDS Treatment Group, the EATG, in various positions since uh, 2004 already, and he's also co-chairing the Correspondent Working Group at uh, Swiss Medic. Within AITG, um, he was from the beginning active and, and leading also the ECAP, which is the scientific working group of EATG. Um, and uh, he also, once he was not anymore the chair, he was very much involved and stayed involved um, in the work of ECAP. Um, and we will hear about that work in uh, much more detail. The second speaker, um, a warm, very warm welcome as well to Dr. Brian Woodfall. Um, he is Canadian. He is a physician, head of development and global medical affairs in Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson and Johnson. Uh, he completed his medical degree at the University of Saskatchewan and followed uh, and uh, afterwards did a postgraduate training at the University of British Columbia. Uh, for 15 years, he had a private practice treating HIV patients. So he has really the practical experience from these very difficult times uh, in the daily interaction with patients suffering from that disease. And he was then a co-founder of Spectrum Healthcare in Vancouver. And in 2003, he then joined the pharmaceutical industry at Tibotech, um, which uh, was a, at the time a small biotech uh, company in Mechelen in Belgium. Uh, but that was then acquired by Johnson & Johnson, so uh, Tibotech belongs now to the Johnson & Johnson family. Um, and he was then head of medical department at Tibotech, uh, responsible for global development of, area, uh, of drugs in areas of uh, HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis. Um, and then he made his way into medical affairs for Janssen, being first vice president for medical affairs of Janssen, covering the EMA region, and now is head of development and global medical affairs for infectious diseases and vaccines. So very impressive um, uh, CV and uh, obviously very, very much involved in the development of uh, treatments in this area of indication, knowing the disease from the doctor's side, from the treating physician's side, and from the researcher's side. So with this, I would like to um, invite um, David Harry to, to start and present um, the first case and uh, tell us a bit of uh, background on um, how the whole thing came together. Please, David. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Uh, we, for the first uh, story, for the first case, we need a little bit of background to understand uh, why this uh, a case is so important, and I start off in 1981 when the first AIDS case was reported. 84, uh, we learned that uh, the illness, the disease, was caused by a human retrovirus, and already 87, the first effective antiretroviral drug was approved, and you might think that's very quick. It was indeed quick because the drug was on the shelf. It was developed for cancer uh, years before, but seen ineffective. The drug is still in use today. Uh, what was seen, however, was that the drug became ineffective of, after a couple of months, uh, and we didn't understand what was happening. The, the virus just became resistant uh, to the drug, but we, we didn't know what to do. Then in 91 and 94, uh, two additional drugs from the same drug class, the, the NRTI, were approved, and we found out that when patients were treated with both substances at once, uh, that this was a little bit more effective, but still not a breakthrough uh, than the single treatment with AZT only. Uh, finally, in 95 and 96, we had the big breakthrough with three uh, new substances in a new drug class, the protease inhibitors. 
and the so-called treatment cocktail with two NRTIs and one protease inhibitor started to be uh, prescribed to patients. In the following years, people survived, however, a lot of people survived, however, uh, many others also lost their life and their hope due to accumulated multidrug resistance accumulated over time, which was at the beginning still poorly understood. We, we didn't have the tools uh, to understand what was going on. Uh, finally, in 2003, we had a very effective drug approved, T20, uh, manufactured by Roche, which became uh, a treatment of last resort. Uh, it had to be injected twice daily. It was extremely expensive and uh, clearly not a solution in the long run. And by then, everybody understood that multidrug resistance would be the biggest treatment hurdle uh, at that time that had to be overcome. Next slide, please. Uh, and looking at the HIV resistance in the Swiss HIV cohort study, you see the figures uh, regarding patients that started treatment before 1999. 56% of them had resistance mutations, 18% had NNRTI resistance, that's another drug class, 54% had NRTI resistance, that's the first drug class uh, where AZT belongs to, and 28% had protease inhibitor resistance, that was the new drug class from the breakthrough time in 95-96. 22% of all patients had resistance to two classes of treatments and 11% had three class resistance, resist, being resistant to everything. So that was the situation, patients in the Swiss court study before 99. Next slide, please. Uh, so we started to understand on, on our side uh, that uh, due to the drug development history, one drug after the other being uh, experimented and, and tried out in, in, in studies, many patients were exposed to single active drugs uh, when they entered uh, pivotal trials. And they uh, accumulated this multidrug resistance over time. The other factor was that treatment schemes back then were so difficult and the pill burden that high and adherence requirements very, very demanding and all this contributed. You, you had treatments, I remember to have started with 27 pills a day and I had to take these pills around meals and no meals and, and things like that. It was a nightmare. The whole uh, day was was uh, driven by which pill to take when and with or without food. Uh, that was mid-1990s. So <clears throat> we also understood that the pivotal trial with two new compounds in two different drug classes could be a remedy and a help to these people who had multidrug resistance. But we could not find two companies to run a joint pivotal trial. This was impossible to do. Uh, however, in 2005, uh, we got in touch with Tibotec, or Tibotec got in touch with us. This was a, a little company in Belgium. They really understood resistance because they had a resistance database, and they had built a drug pipeline uh, based on fighting resistance. And they also had two compounds in two classes in development uh, almost simultaneously. So these were the people uh, we were looking for, and uh, we then managed to uh, convince the FDA and the EMEA to uh, accept such a study. And now I hand over to Brian, who will tell the story of this trial from the company side. Great. Thanks very much, David. That was uh, a good uh, memory lesson of the first 20 years of the HIV uh, epidemic. And uh, thankfully for those of us in the developed world, it, it seems like a bit of a remote memory now, thankfully. Uh, but I want to walk you through the case, as you said. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, which is around the duet 
phase three studies. And we named these trials duet specifically for that reason, that we were using two of our investigational agents together, and we felt that those two drugs together could make beautiful music together, and so we named them the duet studies. And it was the first time, as David had said, that two investigational agents were studied in combination in a treatment experience patient uh, population. On the next slide, just to reaffirm some of what David's told you, the environment that we were working on in the early 2000s um, was that the concept of co the cocktail, the highly active antiretroviral treatment, or HART as it was known, was very well established as being the um, best in class way to approach um, HIV infection. We did at the time have multiple ARV classes, um, and we had new agents emerging in many of those classes. However, um, there was increasing multidrug resistance, which was really driven by prior, what we now know was inadequate therapy, and successive functional monotherapy, meaning adding one new agent to a failing regimen. And very quickly, that new agent, the virus would become resistant to the new agent. And so the impact of functional or sequential monotherapy was very limited. Um, there were a large number of patients in the developed world who had few or no treatment options at the time with the currently approved agents. And really, their hope for new active therapy relied on the new investigational agents that were coming forward. And those could really, in that current structure, only be accessed essentially one at a time, which led to this um, sequential monotherapy. So it was very clear to us that patients and healthcare providers were really pushing for access to multiple new investigational agents active against drug-resistant viruses to be used in combination um, at that time. However, we were very unsure um, and very uncertain about the regulatory acceptance of such an approach and at which stage of drug development would they allow us to combine those agents. Additionally, the pharmaceutical companies were very reluctant to collaborate with their new investigational agents with other companies. Um, most of our clinical trials and early access programs prohibited the concomitant use with other investigational agents, so really forced patients into this sequential monotherapy if they were to access new investigational agents, which we have already said was uh, inadequate therapy for the long run. On the next slide, um, to, to reaffirm what David said, the situation for us as Tech, a small biotech company here in Belgium in 2005, was we had two different drugs in two different classes. Um, and both of these drugs had been specifically designed to be active against drug-resistant virus because, as David said, we were a company that was built on a lot of deep knowledge in the mechanisms of resistance, and we had a very large resistance database that helped us to select and, and further develop agents that were active in that drug-resistant setting. So TMC114, which is the generic name Darunavir, was an investigational protease inhibitor that was designed to be active against drug-resistant virus and had shown really substantial clinical benefit as a single new agent in the phase 2B power studies. And TMC-125, generically known as a traverine, was an investigational non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, NNRTI, that had demonstrated activity against NNRTI-resistant virus. So both of these were very close to each other in the development phase. And as David has said, we were unique at the time in having two drugs in two different classes that had that type of activity. So we as a company, um, with those assets in mind, really sought input from external stakeholders, and that included healthcare providers, community advocates, and regulatory agents about how we could construct phase three registrational trials for TMC-125 specifically, since the TMC-114 trials phase three trials had already been initiated. From the external stakeholders, there was clear consensus that we should address the patient population that was most in need of new active agents, and that was those with multidrug resistance who had limited or no treatment options with the currently available drugs. There was a very, very strong sentiment that was made very apparent to us as a company to allow that it would be most appropriate to allow the use of our investigational TMC-114 in the TMC-125 phase three trials so that patients could access two new investigational agents at the same time. So we as a company proposed those plans 
and sought consensus and approval from our internal stakeholders within the company for such an innovative approach. So it maybe isn't known that within the company there are also a lot of different opinions and different stakeholders that all have to be brought together and moved in the same direction for things to actually happen, particularly things that are new, different, or innovative. So we work with our clinical colleagues, the regulatory groups, drug safety groups, our commercial colleagues, and of course our senior management who had to approve and fund all of these uh, plans to really get a consensus to move forward. On the next slide, um, I just want to highlight a little bit the risks for the company. And this um, was something that we as a company had to um, really be clear about internally and make sure that we were willing to take these risks. And it's also another reason to think about when why it's even harder if it's two different companies collaborating to put their assets together. Certainly, we, we felt that the activity of the background treatment, because we were going to give um, PMC 114 and we were going to allow for the optimization of as many other active agents as a, as a patient could construct, that because of the activity of that background regimen, we may actually not um, be able to demonstrate the benefit of TMC-125 and would have a risk of a negative phase three study, which would not allow us to registra register the drug or get the drug approved. There is also a risk that if there was an unexpected or serious safety finding in the trial, it may actually be attributed to both of the investigational agents and therefore affect both development programs. That could affect potential to influence the labeling with precautions or contraindications, increased monitoring, or restrict clinical use. So there is a, was a risk, a known risk, that both drugs could be um, contaminated, if you like, by safety um, adverse events if it was not clear which of the drugs was causing it. And lastly, there was a possibility that we would get an approved label, but it is, that it would restrict the use of TMC-125 only to be used in combination with TMC-114 because that's how we had studied it. Uh, the, the consequences of that is it could certainly deny some patients benefit from TMC-125 if they could not or would not be able to access TMC-114. And there is also, of course, a commercial impact if we had to have such a limited uh, label um, that had to be taken into consideration as well. So this shows you where we ended up with the DUET trials, uh, the design um, of the trials. We looked at patients who, had, who were on a failing uh, uh, regimen who had documented evidence of resistance to the currently available NNRTIs, um, as well as the PIs. So this was a heavily treatment experienced and drug resistant population. And patients were randomized either to receive active TMC-125 or a matching placebo. But the unique thing was that in the background regimen, the other drugs in the treatment cocktail, was darunavir, also known as TMC-114, boosted with ritonavir. And that was a new drug for most patients who had, where it had extreme activity against their virus. They could optimize the nucleosides used in the background regimen, and optionally they could use T20, which David had talked about earlier, that sort of um, that last chance um, injectable in fubertide uh, that was available um, in the early 2000s. On the next slide, um, this shows you, um, actually we recruited two mirror trials, two identical trials, DUET 1 and DUET 2, each with about 600 patients. And you can see here that these truly were global trials. So we were able to get approval to move forward with the trials in North and South America, across Europe, um, and in Asia Pacific as well. And this was a combination of, of course, um, the company proposing and, and sort of uh, providing a strong rationale for these trials, but we really did benefit from community advocates and healthcare professionals, local uh, opinion leaders, as well as global opinion leaders, really supporting this new approach that was in the best interest of patients and could still be really good, robust science to allow for registrational uh, assessment of, of new agents. On the next uh, slide. Um, this actually shows you, I just wanted to show you some of the great results that we had. So this was the, the, the primary endpoint, which looked at undetectable viral load, less than 50 copies, which is the most stringent um, requirement of success, if you like, in, in chronic um, HIV therapy. And we saw that we got a really good response in the placebo group even, and that's because um, there was active drugs and optimization of the background regimen. 41% of patients at week 24 in this very advanced patient population 
um, had completely undetectable virus by week 24. And in the TMC-125, where you got more um, a active antivirals together, you had 59% response. So clearly it's statistically significant and very clinically relevant um, in terms of the treatment effect. On the next slide, um, I just wanted to show you what it was one of the most important lessons, and this came from other studies as well, but certainly was very much reinforced in uh, the duet studies. If you look at the green bars, this looks at how many, um, how many fully active drugs were used in the regimen. And the green bars are the placebo uh, plus background regimen. And you can see when you go from zero, the response is 8%. If you get one active agent, it's 30%. If you have two or more, it's grows to 67%. So a very clear lesson that the more active drugs you have, the better the response. And of course, when you add TMC-125, another active drug on top, which is the purple bars, for each of these um, categories, you saw the additional effect of another active agent. So really this um, underlies some of our current thinking of how to, um, uh, how to optimize treatment regimens for patients, particularly those with drug-resistant virus. The next slide. So the FDA, we did get an approved label from the FDA, um, and the original indication was for travarine um, is an HIV-1 specific NNRTI um, to be used in combination with other antiretroviral agents uh, for treatment experienced adult patients who have, um, a, who have drug resistance in, in essence. So uh, a broad label to be used with combination. The next slide shows you the European label. We had more challenges with the European approval because the Europeans um, felt that because we studied it only with a boosted PI, being uh, TMC114, that the indication should be restricted to the travarine used in combination with the boosted protease inhibitor. There was even discussion at that time. Um, some regulators felt that it should be even more restricted to restrict it to the use with TMC114 boosted with ritonavir. However, um, we did in negotiations get it a bit broader than that, but we still think that this is more restrictive than what it should have been. But it's a, it, it's a consequence of the way that we designed the trials. Next slide. So I just wanted to um, point out some of the lessons that we learned specifically around the patient engagement through this whole process. We found it was really, really important to involve patient advocates very early on in the development and the design, and continuously through design and execution of that phase three program. We included patient advocates and clinicians in the same advisory boards, which we felt maximized the interactions and the value of the feedback that we got. And we had patient representatives from both the US and the EU review the phase three protocols prior to finalization and give us useful um, input, feedback, um, and comments. We also included patient representatives on the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, that's the independent group that um, unblinds and looks at data as the trial goes on. Um, and when we, the data was available, we shared that data in dedicated community group forums, including ECAP. Um, so what's the environment today? And um, I think things have changed considerably. So the concept of individually optimizing HIV treatment regimens to maximize the number of new or fully active agents including the use of multiple investigational agents where appropriate, is really now considered the standard of care. And the results, I think, of, of the, that approach across clinical practice has really um, resulted in the prevalence of drug resistance declining substantially, and particularly multi-drug resistance has really declined um, very much. And I think David will um, give you a few more figures on that or a uh, scenario of that as it is today. And also, the approach of combining multiple investigational agents in specific infectious diseases has now become quite common. For example, when we developed our uh, hepatitis C uh, drug uh, known as semeprevir, be even before approval, we had cross-company collaborations where we were um, working with BMS, uh, investigating it in, use, in combination with the cladosphere. We were working with Pharmacet and later Gilead in combination with Cephosbivir. So by then, we had, uh, that, uh, that principle had been well established and co various companies recognized the importance of putting new investigational agents together in uh, very active combinations. <clears throat> so with the, for the next slide, I'll turn it back to David to talk a little bit more about the current state of drug resistance. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Excellent summary. Um, 
Uh, here comes the data that actually made the case for me and to present this uh, this case uh, on this webinar, because this is very new data published this spring by the Swiss HIV court, again looking at uh, HIV drug assistance, and here is the picture we have today with patients that initiated treatment between 2007 and 2013. We have only 10% of patients with resistance mutations. That's down from 56% in 99. We have only 4% people with NNRTI resistance. That's down from 18%. We have 5% NRTI resistance. That's down from 54%. And we have 2% protease inhibitor resistance, that's down from 8%. Finally, we have only 1.7% of two-class resistance, meaning resistance to two different drug classes, that's down from 22%. And we have only 0.2% of three-class resistance, that's down from 11%. So this is groundbreaking and, and uh, a complete change of the picture. Um, even if you see these low resistance numbers now, uh, these people can be treated somehow. So the T20, the, the last resort treatment, uh, I think it still exists, but there may be one or two patients worldwide or, or in Europe uh, still taking this drug. Uh, one important note, though, this data applies to Switzerland and other, other Western European countries, perhaps also, also the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Multidrug resistance continues to be a serious problem in resource-limited settings like Africa and Eastern Europe. Uh, finally, another very good side effect of the DUET trials, Brian mentioned that uh, the studies were reviewed, the protocols were reviewed by American and European activists. This fostered our collaboration uh, from then on, because in the past, prior to the duet trial, we often had different opinions, and which was not helpful. And the duet study brought us to a table and we started talking to each other, which was very helpful. And now I'm done. Uh, and we can open for questions. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, extremely interesting. Um, I would like to open the floor to, to the attendees. So please, if you have uh, questions, um, start typing, and uh, then I can see the questions and uh, can um, assign the questions uh, to, to the two speakers. So please feel free to, to type. Um, while you are typing, um, I have a, a first question myself, um, and this is concerning the, the interaction that in fact took place. How did that practically, technically work? Did you have face-to-face -face meetings? Were these regular meetings? Were there delegates from the patient side uh, that were um, yeah, dedicated to that role were that individuals that Tibotech has approached. How did that practically work? This interaction. And from from our side, from the patient side, we had ECAP, which was an existing model. Uh, the American activists also had something similar, uh, where we met regularly with companies, and in this context, we had, we were in touch with with uh, Tibotech, as it was called back then. And when uh, the duet studies came up, when when the idea came up to have these studies done that way, uh, Tibotech uh, organized a joint meeting in Belgium. Where, we, where both groups would meet and we discuss things uh, jointly between the US and, and the Europeans. And then we went back uh, to our normal work and we had follow-up meetings the US, uh, on the US side and on the European side. Okay. Yeah, Very and I would, just, yeah. uh, I would just add exactly, um, I think it was really important that that face-to-face -face and personal connection and spending time together, I think, really helps solidify the relationships. Um, for the when we got to the point of having um, individual patient advocates review the, the phase three protocols, for example, or participate in the DSMB boards, we then um, for those 
uh, individuals, we reached out to the different organizations like ECAP and asked who would they want to volunteer to sit on this position. So they would select one or two or three people that we would then include for those smaller group uh, activities. Okay. Um, perhaps that can be directly followed by the question from Anne Bouvier, um, who uh, she asked, what was the mechanism put in place for patients to review the protocol? Um, how did you measure understanding of scientific language? What were the sticky points of discussion, respectively, uh, respectively the protocol, for example, inclusion criteria? Uh, I have to answer that. This was an established uh, mechanism at the ECAP which we strengthened a little bit in these years because the, the pipelines back then were quite full and a lot of compounds were being developed. We started forming review teams uh, and the teams would be led by a team leader and the team would include at least three experienced people and one person to be trained. And they would uh, focus specifically on uh, reviewing inclusion and exclusion criteria and maybe comment on secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint is usually something we had already agreed on or we were happy with, but uh, some secondary endpoints or quality of life uh, measurements uh, were things we, where we wanted to contribute. And then people got the protocol on the confidentiality, reviewed everybody on their side uh, for about two, three days. They had time to do that. And the team leader collected the review comments, uh, accepting or refusing comments, and forming an opinion a single opinion by the group, and then we sometimes needed a teleconference to agree on these things. And the final, the agreed comments were then sent back to the company. Turnaround time, uh, five work days. You need to be very well organized to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is definitely not I, trivial. No, I can I can then add to the sort of the company perspective. So it's very interesting to hear David. You explain sort of how you guys organize it because I must say the first time that I was involved in this, I was a little bit hesitant because to your point, I wasn't sure what would be the quality of the feedback, if you like, um, what would be the amount of feedback, and so on. I was incredibly impressed that um, when that feedback came back in a very short period of time, because we didn't give you many days to do that. Um, that it, that it was very, very high quality feedback. The comments had been very well thought through. Um, and and um, with, you, could, you could certainly see that there was a high level of understanding, not only of scientific um, understanding, but also of clinical trial design, of what regulators might look for, and so on. Um, what we did with those comments is we then went through them in, again, probably a couple days. Um, we found many that we accepted fully. We found good comments about how to improve um, inclusion exclusion to be more patient-friendly, sometimes um, comments that help make it more uh, gender-friendly to um, populations that aren't usually represented so well in trials. Um, there were some comments that we, we didn't accept, of course, that we, we had specific reasons for not accepting. Um, um, and then what we did, um, we revised our protocol, and what we did back to the community was we list, listed all of the comments that they had made, and then we explained either we accepted this one or this one we didn't accept, and here's the reason why. So we gave feedback back to the community, and I think we had some back and forth discussions on some of those, but I think in general, um, again, it was we all benefited from that um, process because it made our protocols better. There was no question, um, and I think the community, it was really important to have them as advocates for our trial, particularly in such a sort of unique setting where there were a lot of hurdles for us to cross. 
Excellent. I think the, the question from Petra Balasova um, goes into the same direction of, of the thoughts that I had as well, uh, the continuation so, um, of, of this process. So there was this discussion um, first within the company, then uh, with the, the really very well commenting patient uh, organization, and um, there was the, the feedback loop. Then you had a better protocol uh, that made even more sense, but then you had to convince the, the competent authorities. How did you do that? Was that a scientific advice? Was that a scientific advice in which the patients took part, or how did that work then? Scientific advice didn't really work back then. Yeah. Uh, as far as I remember, we sent a letter. Okay. Back then to the EMA. Yeah. And, 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 and this letter was taken on board. I, I seem to remember that we 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 also gathered that letter from you and included it in our in our package of along with some other you know healthcare professionals and so on um, as well. Um, and then we went to a scientific advice with the EMA and to the end of phase two meeting with the FDA where you discuss in detail those protocols and the reasons uh, the rationales behind them. The happy coincidence was that everybody agreed, the scientists and, and, and the company and uh, the patients, that this was the way to go. There was okay. zero disagreement between anybody. Absolutely. Excellent. So um, that means this was then really involvement of patients at the very early stage. Was then an uh, involvement of patients also during the organization of the trials? Was this collaboration continued, or was that done with other groups, or um, was the, the patient involvement in this case really restricted to the drawing phase of, um, of the No, of the no. Uh, this continued. We went to all the investigator meetings, uh, and uh, we got the data firsthand. Okay. Safety data and efficacy data, we were always... Uh, we knew what was going to be presented at the next conference. Okay. So we, we really, for those representatives that had been put forward by the European and the U.S. advocate communities, we really included them on the same list as we did with the inv confidential investigators for the, for the uh, studies. So the investigator meetings, the review of the data before publication, et cetera. Okay, very good. Are you aware, and this is, uh, I think, uh, a question that goes, um, that is uh, along the lines from Roberto Martin, uh, or Martin, um, is there any commitment to join collaboration nowadays with big pharma? Is there, was this a, a first example, are you aware of other companies that are um, doing these type of collaborations now? This is... Uh established in HIV and hepatitis C with almost everybody. Uh, I mentioned before that we still have some companies who don't want us in investigator meetings. Uh, we still have some, a few companies where we have to cry for getting protocols at draft stage, but with most companies it works. Okay. Very good. Um, there is another question, a different topic now, uh, but I think it's also very important uh, from Jeff Taylor. Given the current state with few patients who have now multidrug resistance, what hope is there that a similar approach could be done by two separate companies to study new therapies and perhaps more importantly, how to commercialize new therapies with low numbers? So uh, have you achieved too much for further development of treatments in, in AIDS? Um, that's a very, very difficult question. Um, it, of course, it's uh, very relevant um, for uh, that small number in that situation, uh, but also thinking forward to if that number are, is to grow in um, over the future. Um, it, it's a difficult question because to, to Jeff's point, and he's pointed out that the commercial realities make it, uh, of a small patient populations, make it much more difficult to um, to support large development programs of new agents. And you'll, you'll know that because there's very few new antiretrovirals um, being developed for HIV. There's a few, but there's not met very many. Um, and um, I think that um, 
there's been consolidation as well in the industry in terms of companies involved in HIV. There's probably only three or four major players nowadays in, in HIV. And um, those three or four, um, we do collaborate, um, often in post-approval um, settings uh, to make fixed dose combinations or signal tablet regimens. Um, but I think until there is um, probably um, greater demand and greater pressure, um, it may be difficult for new agents to come forward, particularly multiple new agents at the same time. So in some cases, it is you might see it as a bit of a victim of the success of, mm -hmm. of, of therapy. Now, of course, where, where a lot of therapy is focused now, or a lot of research is focused, is working towards functional cures, um, increased ways of preventing HIV, um, as opposed to, of course, waiting to treat patients when they have a very uh, late stage or multi-drug resistant virus. Okay, very good. So um, I think yeah, that were extremely important questions. Um, there are others that they also fit then uh, for the second case, but in the interest of time, I think it would be good to um, to hear the, the next um, case and, and to learn how that went and what the issues were there and how they were tackled. That's Brian. Sure. Yes, Brian, if you would. Continue, yes, please. thanks. Okay, I'll carry on. Thanks. This is so. This is the case of long-acting ropivirine, or as it's also known, TMC two seven eight LA, meaning long-acting. And ropivirine um, TMC two seven eight is an NNRTI. Um, so it is sort of the next uh, NNRTI that we developed after TMC one twenty five. Um, and this has the potential to improve adherence and convenience in HIV maintenance therapy. So, again, looking back to the environment in the mid-2000s, um, the HIV treatments were evolving to more convenient and less frequent dosing. So, we had by that time many once-daily antiretrovirals. We were moving towards fixed-dose combinations and single-tablet regimens that were much more convenient. However, it became quite clear that poor adherence, both short-term and long-term poor adherence, was emerging as one of the major reasons for treatment failure which often then led to drug resistance. Um, at Janssen, within our company, we had specific expertise in long-acting injectable formulations in other disease areas, for example, in, psych in psychiatry. And it sparked an interest um, at that time about could we utilize that technology and apply it to antiretrovirals. So um, around this, this was a presentation from Croy in 2008. But I have to tell you that the initial thinking about long-acting started in about 2004, 2005, and it took us a few years to work up a formulation that we could use first in animals and then in very early human clinical trials. So this was the first presentation publicly of um, long-acting TMC-278, which is a parenteral or um, injectable depot formulation that delivered sustained NNRTI plasma concentrations both in animals and in clinical settings. So you can see here, this was, these were the early form of this um, injectable. It came in a small syringe, uh, single-use syringe. Um, and unlike T20 that we talked about in treatment, which was given twice a day, every day, um, and had major sort of challenges to, to the use of that, the innovation of this nano suspension is we could put a very um, um, concentrated amount of TMC-278 in this syringe that were particles of pure TMC-278. So if you looked at them microscopically, very small particles of pure drug. And with that, we were able to um, study it both intramuscular injections, subcutaneous injections, first in rats and dogs. Um, and we looked at the tolerability as well as the pharmacokinetics. Um, and the intent of this was to utilize hopefully once a month or once every two months injection, so very infrequent, um, so that you could get away from oral dosing every day um, and use infrequent injectable formulation. On the next slide. So what we, what we, the po question we posed to the, to the community um, uh, at the time in 2008 at Croy was could we create a new paradigm? So we thought that uses of such formulations 
could include once, m once a month injectable, um, highly active antiretroviral therapy. We could maintain undetectable viral load. It maybe could be used for prophylaxis or prevention. Um, and by using infrequent injectable dosing, it could have some potential advantages over every day taking an oral tablet. Um, sustaining the concentrations of drugs in plasma, so therefore the problem of poor adherence becomes less um, of, a, of an issue because you have these very sustained concentrations, which may improve adherence to therapy or prophylaxis, and may avoid gastrointestinal adverse events because you didn't have to take anything orally. On the next slide, so that was in um, Croy around the time of 2007, 2008. We also, I wanted to show you, um, I went back in our archives and found um, minutes that we had or questions that we utilized in an advisory board that was comprised of both patient advocates as well as clinicians that we brought them together here in Belgium face-to-face, -face, had a, actually a two-day session, one, on pro, one day on prophylaxis and this day on maintenance therapy. And here are some of the kinds of questions that we were asking uh, the community at large at the time. So how big are the benefits of improving adherence or compliance um, for HIV-infected individuals? Would um, HIV-infected individuals accept injections on an in, uh, infrequent basis as opposed to a daily pill intake? What regimens, including frequency and duration, would be most um, uh, um, uh, acceptable in terms of substituting for oral therapy? Um, and how frequent could these um, injections be to be um, sort of acceptable to, to individuals as well? Um, on the next slide, a few more questions. We asked about what should a study look like if we were to study this as a proof of concept? How would we study it? We asked about what um, what populations, if we had to give oral nucleoside therapy in, a, in addition to um, injectable for one component, what sort of patients might be appropriate for that sort of therapy? But really, number seven was the important one because we heard very clear feedback from the community that if this kind of a injectable um, approach is going to work, you have to have the full regimen in the injection. It's no good to have one as an injectable and still have to take pills every day for the other components. So number seven was an important one. Where should we focus our search for a second or third long-acting antiretroviral that could be used um, in combination with PMC-278? And here comes this famous advisory board from December 2007, where I par participated. Um, very funny to think about this now. Uh, <clears throat> so our concerns back then were around resistance still. Long-term adherence was really challenging. Achieving 95% adherence lifelong is something unthinkable uh, or something very difficult to, to achieve with patients. You would normally uh, be happy if people achieve 65-70% of adherence in HIV. This was clearly not enough. 95% was uh, the goal to reach. Uh, gastrointestinal side effects, uh, that's something considered to be a minor issue for uh, our physicians, but quite major for patients' quality of life. I was one of the people affected by this. Uh, if you have diarrhea all day uh, and, and, and all year long, it's no fun. So uh, avoiding such side effects by an injected treatment was something uh, important to us. And finally, uh, antiretrovirals could work as prevention, but it was not clear back then uh, how this would run in uh, how this would be done in practice. Uh, despite the bad memories many of us had with injectable drugs, talking T20 twice daily, the prospect of having a long-acting nanosuspension was exciting if the full regimen could be delivered by this route. And prevention use was also seen as something really important and useful, especially if it would be accessible in low-income countries like Africa. Uh, it would also address adherence issues effectively because adherence to prevention is much more challenging than adherence to treatment. 
the concern we had back then uh, was that an oral lead-in has to be available. You cannot start treating patients with an injectable where the drug stays in the blood for four or five months. Uh, you have to start orally to see if people tolerate the drug. So the lead-in uh, phase uh, was something important and the drugs had to be available in an oral formulation as well. Uh, that's my thoughts about the advisory meeting. Now I'm back to uh, Brian. Sure. Yeah. So, so um, we we move forward now. You remember that is that was like 2007, 2008. So we're talking almost eight years ago now. Um, and where have we gone since then? Because um, what what took most of the time was to find other long-acting antiretrovirals that could be used in combination. So we um, actually have partnered up with um, GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, um, as they have a long-acting formulation called GSK744 long-acting, which is an integrase inhibitor. Um, also, its generic name is cabotegravir. So it's a, you can think of it as a, an analog of dolutegravir, although this one is specifically designed to be able to be used in a long-acting formulation. So this was the phase two study called the LATTE-2. It was presented at CROI this past year, the 32-week analysis that you see circled on the bottom. And in this trial, um, we did use um, oral uh, lead-in, um, and then patients were uh, randomized to either receive um, the different doses, but the two drugs um, as uh, intramuscular injections, so uh, both the integrase inhibitor plus the NNRTI uh, injectable either every four weeks or every eight weeks um, in the green box. And then the comparison was um, oral dosing all the way along, so comparing it to a, a standard three-drug regimen of an integrase plus two um, nucleosides um, as standard oral therapy. So the 32-week data of this was presented at uh, CROI, and you can access that presentation, where we showed that, um, in essence, that the uh, maintenance of suppression was similar across all three arms. So the injectable, uh, both for every four week and every eight week, uh, was holding up in terms of maintenance out to at least 32 weeks. On the next slide. Um, so that was phase two, where we were working with GSK. Um, and uh, as you may know, Vive is also a part of GSK. It's the commercial side. And um, to forward this collaboration, in uh, January of 2016, uh, there was an announcement that Vive and Janssen uh, would, would move forward collaborating on phase three programs uh, to seek approval for both the injectable long-acting cabotegravir combined with the injectable long-acting ropivirine as a maintenance therapy for patients who are, are already virally suppressed on their current therapy. Um, and those phase three trials are being um, designed as we speak. So where do we stand uh, now? And actually, the reason why I thought this was a good example were the latte 232 week results presented in February at CROI. If anybody is interested, the link you have on this slide gives you uh, a very good, understandable report from the session where the data was presented. Uh, we have other studies ongoing. Uh, LATTE2 is ongoing, of course, and other studies are planned. I'm right now uh, reviewing two phase three protocols um, with uh, this agent. Um, the assumptions about the strategic benefits we had made in 2007 still hold true. Uh, what has changed are the other regimens uh, to be combined with uh, the NNRTI uh, long-acting substance, uh, because we, since that, th since these days we have a new drug class, the integrase inhibitors, and this is a very, very good drug class with uh, causing very little side effects and being very effective. Uh, so that's a happy coincidence that we now can combine combine uh, an integrase inhibitor with the NNRTI. Uh, in this formulation, you also see how what a long what a long road drug development can be. We are ten years later, and nothing is on the market yet. 
However, I'm really looking forward to a long holiday without thinking about drugs. And uh, this is also a relief when passing customs and borders in countries that don't want HIV positive visitors. I'm listing a few here. Uh, this uh, is an ongoing issue when we travel around. Uh, also, since 2007, pre-exposure prophylaxis has become a very successful prevention intervention for gay men in the United States, France, and some other countries, and having a long-acting formulation will make a huge difference in this population. Currently, these people take antiretroviral drugs either every day or pre- and post-sex to prevent from getting infected. Uh, if they would have an injectable, they would go and see a nurse every eight weeks and uh, for the rest of the time could forget about it. So that's from my side to sum things up on, on this interaction. So still ongoing after 10 years, uh, nine years after the advisory meetings, we are still not on the market, but uh, we are looking forward to a paradigm change when these long-acting injectables become approved. Okay, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so that is really a brand new, uh, no, ongoing, but still uh, longer lasting, but still ongoing um, example of collaboration and improvement of the, the therapeutic options uh, for a disease that um, not too long ago was absolutely killing and um, make, made, made people's life really, really miserable. Um, I mean, the, the way how you describe that now um, seems to me as a, as a woman looking like uh, and a contraceptive that you take prophylactically, so to say, against uh, pregnancy, that uh, gay men will then be able in future to really prophylactically take um, these, these injections practically and, uh, uh, and protect themselves, no? Exactly, so, yes. No, that is uh, it's, it's an amazing um, option, no? Um, yeah, please, questions. Um, we have still some questions from the first round, but uh, please, if you have now questions here to, uh, to this um, example, please um, start typing. Um, while the, the questions are coming in, hopefully, um, the, the, the question, one question for me would be, um, you have been in the in the first example. In the first case, it was um, a group of of, 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 of people within uh, EATG who reviewed the protocol and uh, were practically members of the ECAP. Um, this committee approach has is that really still working? Would you say was that uh, or is that the best approach? Uh, are there then subcommittees um, assigned to a particular product, or how are you handling that in ECAP? Uh, about 10 days ago, there was a call to review this protocol uh, and the ones that are now on the table. And I wrote back to Giorgio, who is our scientific coordinator, that I, that I would love to join uh, another protocol review. I haven't reviewed protocols for, for quite some time, but this one is actually really fun because I was back in this uh, advisory meeting in 2007, and I will be joined by four other colleagues, and uh, we do the work until next Monday. And how, how representative is your work considered by the rest of the team? This is accepted that uh, the group reviews, that the little group reviews the protocol, and people are chosen by the ECAP chair is taking the final decision. He makes sure that uh, the most knowledgeable people are, are there, and perhaps one or maximum two people are being trained reviewing protocols, because you learn that on the job, mm. uh, and uh, that the result is something meaningful. And, and the, the coordinator, one person has to coordinate the review, is responsible for the output. Okay. Um, 
There was one question again from Anne Bouvier before, um, but I think that's also um, clearly still val uh, valid here. Um, what would you recommend for patient groups who may be a lot less informed? I mean, this e the ECAP is really a highly experienced uh, uh, group now, but um, we have to, to disseminate that idea and, and get started in also other areas of indications in there. Um, the patient um, organization members may be less uh, experienced. Is there still a role then to work in this way with a pharma company at this early stage or Absolutely. would you say it's only re reserved for highly experienced no, no. patient groups? No, no. Uh, I had a couple of, the, it's a very good question, I had a couple of occasions presenting our working model in two groups who want to start working uh, in a similar way and uh, I told them you need to start somewhere and you need if you want to play the guitar, you have to play the guitar. Uh, you need to figure out as a group what your priorities in drug development are and what your current issues in trial protocols are. And it might be helpful, it may be helpful, perhaps one of you is a researcher himself or a physician. If not, reach out to the uh, to the physicians in your indication and talk to them uh, what you could be looking out for and form an opinion and once you have this opinion uh, it is helpful to understand something about uh, statistics and the research methodology which is something you can learn in the UPATI toolbox uh, or in the UPATI expert training but the toolbox should be enough and uh, then you start. Okay. Um, Brian, a question to you. Um, how did you find um, the, the patient group that was most, um, let's say, efficiently working with you or that was most suitable for the type of, of advice and collaboration that you were looking for? How did that work in practical terms from your end? For finding the actual group, do you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, oh. That goes back quite a few years. I mean, I think the I think in the HIV area, the um, organized the patient advocate groups were very well organized, um, and fortunately, we had um, EH, uh, the ECAB representing you know a broad European perspective. Um, and over the years, we saw ECAB grow to include you know more Eastern European countries, for example, and so on. Um, I think it's that process of, of uh, passing on and, and bringing forward and, and growing and developing the organizations. Um, but we were we were very connected to them. I mean, it was people who had been very um, involved in HIV advocacy uh, were well known, um, you know, uh, from their work uh, for many years. And so, uh, you know, we had a specific uh, patient engagement group that. Um, reached out and made sure that we maintained uh, constant communication back and forth with those groups. But it was really the well-organized um, and, and coordinated groups that, that we worked with. And I'm not sure that, you know, in some disease areas, those, those kinds of groups probably don't exist yet or are, are much less uh, mature. Um, that raises um, a next question. The, you just mentioned that there was a, a patient ad, um, engagement group um, and uh, what, what we, I think a lot of companies have now these uh, patient engagement uh, teams or department. What we sometimes see is that the internal link between these patient engagement groups and the, the clinical researchers um, are not necessarily close. Um, was that well established from the beginning, or was that one side that pushed more the other to to grow and to 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 fulfill that role or to to grow better together or um because in principle, the idea is of course great to have a patient engagement group that is out there that has the context to the contact to the patient, different patient organizations learns about them, finds out uh, where are particularly knowledgeable people engaged patients uh, who are interested in this collaboration, but there is not necessarily then internally. An, right. an equally close link to those who are in need of this advice. Yeah, that's a very, very good point because uh, all of those links uh, need to be strong for it to work uh, at maximal efficiency. I think that um, we were very fortunate in the early days with, as a small biotech company 
we were very tightly knit small group um, and so um, the patient engagement people were actually very much embedded with the clinical researchers um, and so that wasn't an issue. We're a much larger organization now um, and so we do face bigger challenges exactly as you say that the distance between the researchers um, and the patient engagement people is sometimes a lot, lot bigger nowadays. I think that, so, so I think you have to actively work to establish those really good working relationships and I think it's important, I can only speak from the researcher side, um, that um, what helps me is when people in the patient engagement team develop a personal relationship so I get to know them and I, we get to work uh, well together um, and that they keep, rather than only coming when you know, we need something from you, uh, which is sometimes the case, we need you to do this or we need you to do that, um, is to make it more of a collaborative um, approach, which is really what we experienced in those early days, where it was a win-win, where we, we gained because we did a better job by having the patient uh, engagement, and the patient groups also uh, won by having involvement and in helping us to shape the program. So I think the more that there's seen as sort of that two-sided win-win, um, there's a, n a natural affinity to working together, but it really depends very much on personal relationships that should really be fostered, um, not just at the time of needing something, but throughout the entire process. Okay, and the last question from my side, because I think there are a couple of others that also want to ask questions, but have there been answers from, or let's say, advices from the patient side that were a surprise to you? Where you had thoughts that uh, the outcome would be different? Um, oh, I guess I hadn't really thought of it in that respect. So something that was a real surprise or where we thought um, well, I, I, I mentioned one earlier, which just personally, the first time I got involved with the patients reviewing the protocol, I had no idea the depth of, I was surprised by the depth of knowledge on, as, as David said, statistics, research principles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, was, that was a very pleasant surprise for me. Um, I, I don't, I can't really think of one where, you know, um, it came as a great shock, and maybe that's because we worked so close together, we had very frequent interactions that we sort of knew, you know, uh, on an ongoing basis, um, sort of the, the, the opinions or the perspectives on various things. I, I can't really think of one that came out sort of shockingly as a surprise. Maybe that's a good thing. Okay. Um, David, from your work in ECAP, also with other companies, um, did you have such an example where you made a, a company really buff and uh, they thought, uh, had uh, not thought about an important thing or came up with a different, perhaps also different benefit risk balance than, than the patient organization came? Uh, historically, there were occasions. Uh, and I closely remember the days when uh, a specific drug class was uh, being studied, and that's the CCR5 inhibitors. Uh, that This was an ongoing race to be first in class in 2006, 2007, and we had uh, three compounds from three companies uh, running uh, side by side. And we had big concerns about this drug class because we thought that uh, the drug was doing something with the immune system that other drugs had not done before. And the concerns were shared uh, widely also by physicians. And we thought that this race between the companies was something not very healthy and we feared for the patients going to the studies and there were lots of issues around these trials uh, because the, the these drugs would actually mimic something that happens in nature. Uh, it would close the entry door to the CD4 cell where the virus is entering and some uh, happy people have a genetic mutation doing that and the drug would now do the same. 
and we we thought that the drug could perhaps also do other things on top we were unaware of and and expose uh, have have changed the immune system of the, of the people uh, these were the concerns back then so i think the companies uh doing the research were surprised uh by the resistance or by the caution we had when these drugs were developed because everybody was crying for new drug classes but there was this one that really caused more concerns than hurrah uh, however one compound failed very early uh, because in phase two in the dose finding studies people had uh, serious side effects they had to stop the trial another trial didn't show uh, enough efficacy. Uh, a third drug made it to the market, but unfortunately, I have to say, was not a big success because the drug looks uh, quite clean and, and, and um, is effective. So uh, that's a discussion I remember. I remember other discussions that were came as a surprise when we wanted uh, uh, people around the entry criteria to those finding studies. Uh, that's phase 2A where, where you establish a dose. In the early days, we were happy to include people who were really sick in there. In the later days, we wanted people to be rather healthy, healthy to go these, to, 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 these, to enter the, such studies because we thought we had established therapies and we had to convince the companies uh, to do that, that they had no benefit from uh, experimenting uh, those finding studies with uh, very sick patients. Uh, these were difficult discussions sometimes. Mm, I can imagine. Um, was there a problem of recruitment um, to, for, for these new approaches uh, that in fact uh, were, uh, were foreseen in both type of, of uh, uh, treatments? I mean, the duet with two unknowns and uh, the, um, the combination here, which is also not known. How open is that community of, of patients uh, to, to participating in clinical trials and in this, let's say, in this innovative type of clinical trials in addition? Well, certainly for the duet trials, um, as we outlined, the, the medical need um, and the the patients in a very difficult position that, that needed multiple new agents was so high at the time that um, we, we, there, were, there were many, many patients that, that you know, uh, wanted to be in the trials. And in fact, after we, uh, I didn't mention it in the talk, but after we finished enrollment of the phase three program, we um, opened up a, a very large early access program had various names in various countries depending on the regulation, sometimes compassionate use, sometimes named patient, um, but um, essentially early access programs. And in those, we allowed, because we had a parallel running program for TMC114, we also allowed the combination in those early access programs. So through those compassionate use type programs, we provided the combination to thousands and thousands of patients um, in the mid-2000s that that we really had very limited treatment options available. So there was no um, really, we were responding to what the patients and the community really needed and wanted. So there, there, there was no, um, no, no challenge to recruitment. Um, with the, with the injectables, um, it's a little different because um, now we're taking, uh, we're looking for people who are, um, you know, well suppressed on their chronic uh, uh, oral therapy. Um, and so really there you're looking for a patient population who um, is willing to uh, try something different, um, be not because they may get immediate benefit, because the benefit would be that they stay suppressed, but contributing to further future treatment options that may open up and, and they obviously, the patients who come into this have to be willing to receive injections once every four weeks or once every eight weeks. Um, so patients who, who aren't interested in injectable forms of therapy would not be appropriate. So it really depends on the, the actual trial. But I think the point is to, if you engage the community, the community helps to um, define that best patient population and helps you to 
uh, target your your programs and your trials to the appropriate pa patient population to you know to get enrolled uh, where it's appropriate. Okay, and following up on that, how open were the investigators, the physician community, to participate in these new approaches? Again, the same thing that many, most of the clinicians were were very um, much wanting to be able to utilize two new investigation agents. So it was a unique opportunity for them. So we had to turn investigators away. We couldn't, uh, you know, accommodate as many um, as would have liked to participate. And again, if you look at the success of our compassionate use programs that followed and the number of uh, clinicians um, that, you know, enrolled for those compassionate use programs and gave uh, combination therapy to their patients, I mean, it was thousands of, of, of investigators. I don't remember the number offhand, but it, again, it was it really was considered to be, I think, the leading edge of um, where therapy needed to go at that time. And so there was no shortage of, of people mm -hmm. that wanted to uh, be involved. Okay, very good. So um, now that things are obviously in swing, what do you think, um, by, how, by when will you have your long-lasting injectables uh, on the market? Are there any plans, of course, uh, that you would like to share with us? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I don't, uh, I don't know the exact timelines off uh, the top of my head, but as David said, the phase three trials are in uh, review. Um, you have to recognize that with injectable trials, because you need, they take longer to do because you need to wait until people have had three or four injections before you're able to analyze the uh, treatment endpoints. So you're probably looking um, uh, at least a year of therapy um, after you've enrolled the full trial. So. I don't know off the top of my head, but it's going to be a few years yet. Okay, so still a bit of patience and uh, more oral therapies than uh, than injectables, really. That's right. Okay, are there any questions from your side? I mean, you have now been uh, squeezed here with questions, but uh, perhaps you also had some thoughts that you would like to share with us or questions uh, to to the, uh, to the other speaker. Uh, I don't, I mean, I've enjoyed collaborating with David for many years. I don't have any specific questions. I just want to thank uh, you, Patty, for the the opportunity. It's been um, very interesting to take a walk down memory lane. Um, you know, we're, in our daily work, we sometimes don't stop to reflect on, you know, some of the, the important work that we were involved in and collaborated in and has actually changed uh, the way things are done for the future. And I think uh, it's been a been a pleasure to sort of take that walk down memory lane and collaborate and, and have the discussion here today. Okay. Well, I do not see any more questions coming in, so I assume we have uh, covered at least most of the burning questions that came immediately into everybody's mind. Um, I would like to thank you very, very much for your very open and, uh, yeah, you you live the collaborative spirit. Um, I think this, the way also how you interacted, the way how you uh, reported about your um, your joint history, the experiences that you made, um, gave to me at least really the impression that there was a lot of um, harmony in jointly um, tackling a very, very difficult situation with innovative approaches, with courageous approaches, um, but mutually supported uh, by the firm belief that um, together the, the things that were decided were the right things. And so I think these are really excellent, excellent um, examples. Um, we should probably really make a major effort to disseminate those experiences further. Um, I would like to thank you very, very much for um, your presentations and discussions here. I would like to thank very much the, the audience and uh, those also especially who have asked questions um, for the participation and active participation. I hope that we could um, give you a good understanding of how valuable it is that patients um, contribute early to the development of new treatments, that the outcome um, of that, such a collaboration is really uh, treatments that are of more value, better value for patients, and that is what we are all aiming for. And a big thank you to Ilaria and her team 
uh, for having provided us with the technical facilities to uh, to make this work, and uh, of course, if you have uh, whoever is on the uh, on the webinar still uh, has questions um, or new questions will come up, please don't hesitate to to contact us, and uh, we will be happy uh, to get you into connection with the speakers, and uh, hopefully, then we'll be able to give you the answers that you are expecting. So, Ingrid, one you, remark. Yeah. One, one remark. Uh, I think we had a. A specific situation with with uh, Tipo Tech uh, that helped us along the o along the way, uh, and this responds to a question that Susanna Leto uh, asked on the on on her side. Uh, we had some meetings where Tipo Tech swamped uh, the ECAP meetings with 14, 15 people, uh, and we had to get extra chairs. Uh, normally, we would have four or five people from a company uh, coming to an ECAP meeting, but Tipotec was next door in Brussels, in Mechelen, uh, and uh, they came with lots of people. And at first, we thought this was a bit annoying. They almost outnumbered us. and. <clears throat> In fact, this really helped the company to get a feeling about what was going on and why this was important. And this has helped the collaboration in the future a lot. Excellent. Yeah, I think this interest, this um, uh, creating broad interest in, in a company, not only some uh, pioneers, so to say, uh, lonely riders, but really uh, and the overall spirit in a company to want to listen, to, to want to have the discussion, to want to mutually learn um, is, is certainly something that also changes um, the spirit internally, but also in that in such a collaboration, um, quite substantially, and uh, I think that is a very important um, aspect, uh, David. And I think uh, um, it's it's really important to live and expand um, as an as an aim uh, to to expand the the collaboration to more and more people, uh, to expose more and more people to that positive experience that this collaboration can really be beneficial um, on a personal and on a, um, a company um, and patient organization level. Um, Brian, would you like to make any um, final comment? Um, no, again, just again to thank you all for, uh, for the interest and the opportunity. Okay. So thank you very much and uh, have a very nice evening and hopefully you will participate in our next webinar again. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes your conference call for today. You may now disconnect. Thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.